Coming up on this episode of the Delta Huddle Podcast. If you, if you want a lesson on how to scale a beta program, you just you just heard the quick rundown of it. That was ex- exactly the things you do to to scale up. Hello, I'm Stefan Stenrus, and this is the Delta Huddle Podcast by CenterCode. On previous episodes of the podcast, we've had industry experts come in and talk about all aspects of beta testing, whether that's starting a program, recruiting the right users, who to bring in for your program, and even just looking at user testing throughout the years. And today's episode is all about bringing that to the next level. Once you've established your program and got some momentum, how do you make other teams see the value in your program? And more importantly, how do you get it so that your beta program goes viral so that everyone across your organization is getting value out of testing? Joining me and Chris Rader to discuss how to make that happen is Alex Larson, Manager of Product and Customer Insights at Trimble Inc. Alex brings over a decade of experience in the user testing field, everything from how to start in user testing all the way up to scaling programs um, and the challenges of testing in his particular field and how he's actually overcome those challenges. Um, Like you heard in our clip, there's a ton of wisdom packed into this podcast. Like Chris said, if you're looking for a rundown on how to scale a beta program, this is the podcast episode for you. And if you just want to learn how to do everything well at scale, Alex has tons and tons of wisdom to share with you. Without further ado, let's discover how to make a beta program go viral with Alex Larson. To kick things off, uh, can you actually tell us more about Trimble, what you guys do over there, and how you got started in user testing? Yeah, so Trimble does a little of everything. If it's if you're involved in heavy industry of almost any kind, there's a good chance you use Trimble technology. So Trimble has uh, is a global corporation that a lot of people haven't heard of, but we build technology that supports almost every... Um, like I said, heavy industry. So construction, rail, transportation. Um, so like uh, big rigs, tractor trailers, uh, commercial trucking, um, design, 3D modeling, uh, civil construction, uh, automation, autonomous vehicles. Um, Trimble's kind of building software that that sits right in the middle of all of that. And our mission is creating a software platform where if you're in any of those industries, you can subscribe to some element of the Trimble platform to help you do your job. Um, so it's 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 really all over the board. Um, I have lived, my team and I have lived in the transportation division of Trimble since I started there four years ago. And so we've really been focusing on B2B user testing in the transportation space. So we're developing hardware and software for the commercial trucking industry. Uh, Commercial drivers use Trimble uh, tablets and software in the cab to track their hours of service, navigate from place to place with Trimble maps, and uh, much, much more. Translate all the data coming off of the the vehicle bus, the engine, uh, the engine data coming off the the vehicle, all of that is transmitted through the cloud, through Trimble devices, um, so that the folks in their back office can use it to run their business more efficiently. So we were in transportation. I'll I'll get to my origin in a second. We were in transportation for the last four years. And earlier this year, I made a pitch to some of our leadership that after working with some of the other sectors and realizing that I think that there's an easy on-ramp to supporting beta support for the whole company uh, in any sector, any any line of work, any industry uh, can benefit from this practice and and I can use center code to do that. Watch me do it. So I, I, I did that with a few different uh, teams around Trimble uh, just kind of on my own. And then I asked leadership, I said, is there a chance that we can just make my team kind of sit centrally within Trimble and support all of these industries with this practice? So kind of moving us from transportation experts to user testing experts uh, and they liked the idea and and as of January 1st we we moved from being the transportation beta team to being the Trimble product and customer insights team so now we sit centrally in in what's called the platform team and we offer 
uh, alpha, beta user testing services to any and all product teams across the Trimbleverse. And we're we're swamped right now. There's a lot of people that want to get in on this, and um, it's there's there's no shortage of opportunity. So it's an exciting place to be. I'm learning a lot about all the different Trimble divisions, what they do, trying to put it all in context in my brain. It's maybe too much, so I need to um, keep growing the team, growing the program, and, and allow people to specialize maybe a little bit as we expand into these other sectors, these other industries. But we're getting there. We're, we're, we're building. Uh, it's the biggest program I've ever run. I got my start in the home security industry. So I worked for a company called Alarm.com, um, who I believe is still a center code subscriber. I keep up with some of the folks over there. Yep. <laughs> and uh, and I, it's a similar story to maybe what others have said previously and, and, and other stories that I've heard is I started in tech support and I was frontline tech support. And we were a very small team at what was then a startup, probably 120 employees. And I, one day my boss asked me to start doing some testing of new products at my desk because we would get a PDF with a product overview when a new product was launching. And it was like, yeah, we built this and launched it. Also, you're going to get calls on it soon. So here's a PDF with instructions on how it's supposed to work. Be prepared. Be prepared. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, this is this is the product, by the way. We launched it. Um, if you have questions, let me know. But here's the overview PDF. And that's what we would, that was our, that was our launch process at the time. And everyone wore so many different hats that my boss was like, okay, here, you know, you're going to test these products out while they're being developed at your desk and let us know, you know, what we think we're going to get calls about. And so I started by doing that. I started, you know, working with our product teams to be like, Hey, can I get a, an extra copy of whatever you're making so I can try it out and try to figure out what customers are going to call about so we can document it. And then I did that for probably a year and a half, two years. And then at a loud party, uh, at a company retreat, the CTO, I think it was the CTO, um, one of the software heads leaned over to my boss uh, in a conversation we were having and said, we need a beta program. And it was like yelling over the music. And, <laughs> and I was standing right there and my boss just kind of turns to me and he goes, you want to do that? You want that to be you? <laughs> I was like, sure, let's do it. Um, and so, you know, uh, 11 years later here we are um and I've been... <laughs> what, a, what a party conversation yeah you should yeah, really yeah. do a beta <laughs> I'll, I'll <laughs> well, I'll this, is, this is the kind of guy that that would love to talk about uh you know process gaps at a uh, company talk party. shop <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's funny. yeah yeah, a little, yeah yeah it was fun uh but that's that's how i got my start and i i built a, a program at uh, alarm.com. The first thing I did was look up center code, uh, and cause I needed, I was spending way too much time sending emails, uh, and, and managing spreadsheets and, um, realized that I could do the work of four people, uh, with, with, with the aid of center code. And then I grew my team. I had a, a, a teammate that I, that I hired under me. Um, and we worked together to, to build that program up. And then Trimble had, uh, Trimble, I found and I met through uh, through a, a Center Code user conference, and uh, turns out that they also are in my hometown here in the Twin Cities of uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul, and they had a at the time an eight person team managing their beta uh, program, and I was like, I want to get in on that, so I kind of made friends with them, and they had an opening on the team, and I came over. Um, and then I, after about six months as a project manager for on the beta team, I, I applied for and was selected for the uh, manager position. So I've been doing that ever since. A great story. I, I love the, I love the play of, uh, we, we call it dog footing. Did, actually, when they dropped off the product at your desk, like, what did they call that? Just like learning the product? <laughs> um, 
Yeah, I I don't know what we called it. Kind of we it was it's kind of internal beta, I guess was what we called it at the time. Yeah. We did a lot of that. Um the it was the products were mainly um it was it was mostly a mobile app, but it was mm home security technology so you've got a security panel and there and, and alarm.com makes a chip that goes in the panel that allows you to control it from your phone so you can retrofit old security systems um, new security systems have a lot of that built in um, and you can do a lot of cool stuff you can do thermostat control you could do lock control you could you know manage all your home automation in addition to just arming and disarming the system they also did cameras and video and motion detection and all of that so it was a lot of stuff that was fairly dog foodable. You could mm. you could play around with it at your desk. It's a consumer facing product, so you could put your consumer hat on, and and we we were pretty successful with a dog fooding program there. Um, we can't do as much dog fooding at Trimble because we're not all professional surveyors, uh, professional civil engineers. Uh, we're not. We don't have a lot of the expertise and equipment that our folks in the field have, and so mm -hmm. that's what makes beta so valuable for us. Yeah, it's it's definitely a challenge for for a lot of B two B places. Like they they just don't have that use case. Like for example, at Center Code, our HR team isn't running uh, beta tests, so they're them testing out a a tool to run tests isn't necessarily um, super beneficial. Um, in your case they can't even do it because they don't have the equipment to do it. <laughs> I don't have a CDL, right? So I can't hop in a 18 wheeler and I'm let good. you know how well <laughs> our, like our, our hours of service automation works for you. I, 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 I don't really have the perspective to let you know. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I love that the... was something that everyone just did kind of every day, you know, <laughs> at lunch or whatever, just hop in the 18 wheeler and whatnot. Uh, go ahead, Chris. Sorry to interrupt you. No, no, no problem. I love the informality of it. It's like similar to, you know, Luke, our CEO's uh, story. And someone just came to his his desk and said, hey, you got to you got to run a beta. It's like, what the what is that? And that same case for you. Someone comes to you and says, here, I need you to to do your job better by learning this product. Right. Or be able to do your job because, you know, this product. And it's so informal. There's not like a, a standard process. I'm, I'm sure the feedback channel for you giving feedback on the, the product wasn't necessarily a, a big thing. <laughs> Maybe you gave feedback to your boss or said, oh, man, this is not good or that's that's great or anything like that. But it's, it was a, it was a word doc. Right. At the, so I would just do a, a word <laughs> doc for every product that I tested and it would have, you know, some iteration of of fix, improve, promote. Uh, in a, in a word doc. So I, that was it. And I would just distribute it to, uh, my boss and, and, uh, our, our, we had a, what's called a, uh, a knowledge base, which was mm -hmm. an email folder in outlook that we all had access to of important emails. <laughs> and, and that was, that was our wiki. That was our knowledge base. You'd go and look through the, the outlook folder that had all the important emails. The team. Mm, but not even an intranet just like yeah just have access to the folder and click through there and you'll find it eventually yeah it, it, it's startup stuff right it's fun you don't always yeah. have software solutions for everything sometimes you start with an email folder and and you know now i'm, I'm sure they've got uh an incredible uh searchable taggable database of knowledge but it started as an email folder yeah. I love the start too of, of support. We have a lot of people that, that start in support. I think the customer interaction tends to be like, a, oh, this, this person's interacted with customers. So they could probably interact with customers during, during uh, beta time. You don't always want engineers interacting with customers uh, <laughs> in, in a lot of cases, but <laughs> you get the right <laughs> mix of, of technical know-how and the ability to talk technically about anything or your product with the approachability of working with customers. So it, it's it's a great place to start and it's something I draw on a lot and it's something I still feel really passionately about. I think if, if I weren't in beta testing, if I weren't in this field, I would probably try to manage support centers somewhere because I still feel really strongly about how support should be done. Um, and so I, I think that would be my, my, my alter ego if I wasn't in this line of work. 
it's definitely a great start. I've seen a, a, actually a handful of companies sprout from from the support team. I've recruited for my team heavily from support. So when when we have openings, I do really like to give people from support a chance to to see if this is a place they want to move up to. Um, and they always impress me with their because because beta in many ways is about is is beneficial to support you're kind of upstream of support you're trying to make support's job easier Um, so they know what it's like when when you don't have user feedback and when users are blindsided by things they know what that feels like and it's very not fun and they're extra motivated to run great beta projects to prevent that experience for someone else who's in their shoes or who's in, you know, the role that they formerly inhabited. Yeah. So I I think that the support people are, are motivated by their past past experience to run great beta projects and get as much feedback as we can before we put that product into, into supports hands to carry forward. Yeah. I mean, I joked about the be prepared thing. Like someone drops off a product at your, your desk, you need to learn it so you can support those people. It's the same thing when you when you get the support team to listen to customers beforehand, right? So the, the idea is that when you do get calls, when you do get emails, when you get problems that come through, having a previous record of what what things are not fixed, because not everything's going to get fixed in the beta. Uh, we know that, that pretty well. Um, having something that's a knowledge-based article, having something that is a, a, a cool sc- a call script, a workaround, something to, to give customers say, Hey, we understand this problem. Here's how you get around it. Or yeah, we're working on that. It's actively in development. Like you just have a, a good first hand knowledge of what's going on in development, the problems that you're encountering to, to better help those customers. Yeah. Um, two of the big okay. things, two of the big initiatives at, at both companies I've, I've worked at has been to create a known issues database that yeah. is searchable for support. Uh, and that gets updated when new new builds, new uh, releases drop to commercial release, commercial availability. Um, there's usually a whole you know a slew of known issues that get that get uploaded to that database when that happens, and then and we actually have a whole Jira project devoted to it. And so we have you know filtering set up, and it's actually. It, it's changed the vocabulary and the support teams on, on at both companies where now you're referring to specific known issue numbers. Um, and these are all coming out of, they're discovered in beta much of the time. Um, support can also discover them if we miss them in beta and then report them themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, and that just does so much for a support department to just have a shared understanding of, of what issues are expected. Uh, a common language around workarounds, like what you're allowed to tell the customer about that issue, uh, how to resolve it, um, and when we expect it to be uh, fixed, you know, like what build we expect the fix in. Mm-hmm. You can communicate all of that in, in one place, and it makes those calls so much less scary, um, so much yeah. more approachable. I actually had that at, um, at WD when I worked at, uh, at WD. We had, a, we had a list of beta issues that came through. We'd, we'd have the ones that needed to get fixed that, that dev would prioritize before to the next release. Um, and the handful of tickets that we knew were not going to be um, fixed. So we would send those off to our support team, which would then create that knowledge base article um, saying like, here's the known issue. Because most people are going to hit Google. They're going to go throw in a search of here's my problem or here's what's happening. And, and they land on that page versus picking up a, a phone and calling someone, which again, the call centers cost a, a decent amount uh, at scale. So that was just like a, a practice. We'd have a, a status field inside our our issue tracking system that said, okay, this is a, a known issue. We need to create a knowledge base article. This is an issue that needs to get prioritized by, by the dev team. This one's going to be fixed in this release and that release. And the idea was that you collect feedback and it's not a endless hole of information uh, it's that you have something, something you're going to take action on for every every ticket that comes through, and that's value, right? Because you think of beta and you say like, oh, it's gonna we're gonna fix those things. That's the only value I get, right? It's like no, we you're gonna fix those things, and yeah, you're gonna you're gonna save money because you fix those things. 
but then we're going to get even more value by, by taking action on this other stuff that we're not able to address. Um, and it's just, that's the compounding value of, of these, these issues that you collect inside beta from, from customers, from testers. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it all adds up. And, and I think part of it that gets overlooked sometimes is just the impression that the customer gets around your preparedness. Um, so when they call in an issue and you say, yes, we're aware of that. We have it documented. Here's the documentation around the solution. I'll send you a copy of, of the workaround. Like that is such a better experience and such a better reflection on your company than, oh, let's, let's go through the troubleshooting steps. <laughs> yeah. Let's spend an hour troubleshooting it only for me to escalate it. And then someone tell me, oh yeah, that's a known issue. We're aware of that. Um, yeah. Big waste of time. And the, or, or the last thing people it. want when they call support, which they already don't want to do, is to have their time wasted with troubleshooting steps that they didn't need to undertake. So I would love it if I could, like, if, if my internet wasn't working and I called my ISP and just one time they said, like, oh, yeah, there's there's an issue going on. Uh, we know about it and we'll have it resolved in, like, three hours and, yeah. as opposed to, like, all right, let's start by rebooting your rear router, which I've already done, right? So like, yeah, that's that's maybe the experience to avoid. Uh, but I would be very impressed if my ISP was was just straight up with me, like, oh yeah, this known issue, we're aware of it. Here's the workaround. Here's how you can get back online today, um, or here's when we expect to resolve it. That would be really impressive. Kind of that dynamic of proactive versus reactive, right? And I like kind of what you've been saying is that beta testing really puts you in that proactive state of mind where it's like, we're really going to try to catch these things before they, you know, reach the customer and then the customer does all this. I can't count how many times I've tried to go to some forum somewhere that's hosted by a company, but you know, most of it is just users going in and saying, I had an issue. And it's like, well, did you try turning it on and off? You know, and if you work in tech, turning it on and off is like, yeah, that was like 12 steps ago. Yeah. Better. Um, uh, I also heard some something kind of interesting recently. When you're a podcast host, you inevitably start listening to a bazillion podcasts, try to be a better podcast host. Um, but it was Ginny Rometty, who was the uh, CEO of IBM for about eight years. She was talking about just reducing layers between teams uh, in a company and how things moved faster and there was better results overall just by getting teams kind of closer to each other and reducing the amount of steps to get things done. And one thing that you touched on that I thought was really interesting, it was like, when you have these programs in place, you kind of end up being the customer advocate and you reduce those layers between, you know, here's the product team or here's the dev team ideating and here's the customers who are going to be impacted. So I thought that was something really interesting that you brought up. It's like, hey, we can actually reduce the um, distance between the person in the 18 wheeler and the person who's developing this tablet or, or the software, et cetera. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. We we reduce the layers by adding a layer like we, it, you know, it in, in maybe an ideal world with where everyone had infinite time, the products or the de the product folks or the devs would, would directly reach out to the drivers and be like, how are you experiencing the product that I own? Um, but they don't have infinite time and they don't have infinite capacity and energy. So our team comes in as a middle layer and does a bit of the translation of, you know, here's technical release notes. Here's how it's going to impact you, or here's how we expect it to impact you. Does that track with your experience? Um, does that track with your expectations? Is That's where we're trying to move our program away from just bug detection and, and preparing support for the calls that they're going to get and moving more towards getting in sync with the user's sentiment about the product, about the company, um, what makes them more or less likely to adopt a feature, what makes them more or less likely to buy ultimately, because we're, you know, in the business of making money. I think we forget sometimes that that's like the, the core goal. Like you want to make people happy, but you also want them to buy your stuff. Um, so I'm starting to think more, more along the lines of maybe that's because everyone's talking about a recession all the time and it's like recession, recession, recession. Um, Luke Freiler has had wartime CEO in his uh, email signature for like <laughs> for like three years, so I'm I'm in that mindset. I'm always kind of now like, how does how how is this product you know 
my ultimate accountability to like the CEO is, is, is this product going to make money for Trimble? Um, and, and our customers willing to buy this and pay for it? Is this, does this create value for a customer um, that they would be willing to pay for? So that's kind of the ultimate question. And the better that we can build products that solve their problems and, and meet their expectations or ideally exceed their expectations, the more willing they'll be to exchange money for that value. Yeah, exactly. And keep them too and, and retain yeah. them. Yeah. A, a big challenge is, uh, especially during recessionary periods, like it's the idea that you could just lose your customer because they're in a uh, vulnerable position with, with money. So by anything really impacting, they just bring up that question. So if they run into issues where, for example, they're, they're, they're not able to see their, their fleet, like the, the, the fleet management, systems down they can't access it like do we even really need this right now right yeah. that's a problem could i get something cheaper from someone else like it's those things of like you have loyal customers and then they run into something during those periods they're the the risk is much higher to losing a customer margins in transportation in the transport in the trucking industry are razor thin like mm-hmm. if you have a truck sitting on the side of the road out of commission for four hours you're losing like a, a an unrecoverable amount of money that like yeah. your, your whole month is off if you're a small enough fleet. Um, so if you're not, if your vehicles aren't rolling all the time, like you're they're they're losing you money. Um, so the stakes in transportation when we're beta testing were and are really high. Um, we are frequently in a position where, we have to support a customer. Like we'll have a customer run into a bug on a beta and we have to get them an answer today, like right now, because they, they have no choice, but to test this stuff in real trucks. Cause that's what we're asking them to do. Um, we can do a certain amount of testing on simulators in offices, in what we call bench testing situations. But ultimately to understand if this is really truly going to work in the field, they need to put it on a real truck and have a real driver interact with it. And if, if they run into a critical bug, um, that's, that's burning money for them. So it's, it's really important for us to be on that and to have good partnerships with, uh, support and QA and dev so that if that happens, we can swarm on it get a fix as soon as we can or a workaround at least um, and deploy that. We also have to be really responsible in how we deploy beta builds and how quickly we roll them out. Um, so when we launch a new beta, we have to, we, we try and start really slow um, and gradually go further and further, um, get more and more vehicles involved. It's yeah, the stakes, the stakes are really, really high and we can't, we often can't roll back either. Once we've detected a problem, we have to fail forward. We have to send them the newest version that contains the fix. We can't just roll it back. Um, the software is designed to be as simple for the driver as possible. So we don't want them to have to navigate Android menus and 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 deal with build versions and roll them back and stuff like that. We just want them to use the thing and have it work. And their office pushes new versions down to them and they want it to just keep working because they have a job to do. And it's um, Richard actually mentioned this on the last episode because we, we met with their team just to see like, what are the similarities between our programs? What are the differences? It was a really good conversation. And one of the big differences was that our stuff very much feels um like a the risk of a of a that a fleet takes on sometimes in in beta testing um in terms of like running into a critical issue that could affect their operations is is maybe a little higher than someone testing a pair of shoes or something like that um you know i guess so so it's hard for us to get people to sign up Sometimes recruitment can be difficult uh, when, unless you have uh, a lot of new value to give them in exchange, right? Mm -hmm. So there are the unknowns that they're accepting as part of testing. Um, 
that something may not work as expected. We are continuously getting better at escaped criticals. There are very relatively few actual critical issues that, that go out into beta these days, which is great. Um, but we also, we try and be careful to balance that risk that testers assume by putting commercial code on, you know, functioning commercial vehicles, um, and balance that with new value that we're creating that they can take advantage of. So ideally they can save time and money if things go well. And if they identify bugs, we fix them quickly and, and get them back, um, in a, in a good place. You're finding those critical bugs inside the beta. Now this one team or this one company or this one fleet is experiencing that, but you're preventing a lot of fleets from experiencing, which is huge for your company, right? Like super great for them. Yeah. And that, that risk that they're assuming, again, you need to outweigh it with the, those benefits. It's something very similar at, at WD we're doing with, with servers, with drives on servers and people are putting their data, their company information on drives. And we had to be very clear, like, Hey, just want to let you know, here's, here's the situation. Here's the risk that you're assuming. Here's the things. And again, we have to be very, very upfront about the value that they get from it. You get access to influence the product. You get the ability to talk with our, our product teams and you get f first frontline support from real people quickly. So we're all very quick to move and developments there to, to help fix anything. Um, and you're bettering the world by, <laughs> by, by, by solving this problem early. So uh, that, that's a wonderful sentiment that you you just put out, and again, that's still only on the bug side of things, right? Uh, but <laughs> yeah, the, the 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 value they get, we try and really lean on the 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 operationalization of of new code, so they they get an advantage over their non beta participating peers by having a six week period to learn, understand how things are changing, how functionality is being modified or improved or, um, you know, complying with regulations in a new way. And they get to figure out how they want to disseminate that information to their drivers, how they want to train their people who are usually all over the country at any given time. And so training and oper operationalizing change is a, is a big uh, consideration for these fleets. And if you have a longer on-ramp to day one, you know, launch day, um, that's a huge advantage in kind of planning and smoothing out that, that on-ramp. So we, we yeah. lean on that a lot when we're talking about the value. Um, we also, you know, we, we do talk about the influence that they can have, that their, their ideas, their feedback, their contributions to our roundtable calls um, all help us prioritize the, the 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 backlog and make better decisions about what we need to release next, what we need to modify or change, and why. Um, and and that level of influence is huge too. Um, I don't think there are any other companies in our space that have a beta program as developed as we do. So we are able to, at least I'd like to think that that's a differentiator for Trimble is that we offer more ways to get directly involved in the release process and in the development uh, pipeline than our competitors might offer, um, at least in a structured and organized way. Earlier, you were talking about um, just having that influence, right? It seems to be a good strategy for getting investors in and making them feel kind of valued and whatnot. Um, and Richard was talking about in the previous episode, he was talking about the kind of the value of uh, qualitative data, you know, where it's like, hey, this is a, a really interesting story from someone that really kind of made an impact on the team or drove the product in a, a certain way. Do you have any examples of that where it's like we had a, a story from the field that came up and suddenly brought in some new insight to the, the team? Yeah, there's a couple of recent ones that stand out, both examples of new products where we, we kind of introduced them to a very small group of, of users first to see what their initial impressions are. 
they're two different products, but one of them, we had a, like a 10 customer alpha basically for this new, um, this new product that we have. And one of the users at, on a round table call, so we were all on a zoom call together. Um, at the end we asked, you know, does anyone have any, uh, any wins or success stories they want to share with the product so far? And one guy said, I don't know if you guys are looking for brand ambassadors, but I'm, if you're willing to help, I'm willing to print a wraparound decal on a 18 wheeler <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and drive it across the country. I'll put it on one of my cross country runs. And I was like, that's, that's pretty cool. So if we, if we develop a, a, a trailer wrap for, you know, this, this new product, um, and we, you'll put it on your truck and drive it across the country that you liked it that much. Um, and he was dead serious. So I don't, I don't know if marketing ever followed up with them on that. Um, but that was a, that was a big win. That was very cool. Um, and that wouldn't show up necessarily in a NPS score, right? That that's not a it's more than a number. That was a, a good story. And that and that kind of has you know, you tell that story internally and people really turn their heads and they listen. And they're like, wow, we must really have something here if a customer would be willing to advertise our stuff on their own truck. Um and the other one is from a actually is from an NPS. Um we asked uh, we, we put an NPS question on every release and we had one, it was a really small initial beta with, with I think three or four customers, which is sometimes what you get in, in B2B. Um, and so we, we got the, the most feedback we could and we eventually gave an NPS question on this brand new product that kind of brought new value and, and um, utilized our data science team, which uh, was a, a, a new proposition at the time. We didn't have a lot of, um, that was our first product that our data science team put forward. And it was, it helped drivers, uh, it helped fleets utilize, uh, not utilize, analyze their routes for profitability and determine which routes are their most profitable routes and where they should put their resources. And we asked, would you recommend this product to an industry peer or colleague? And he said, no. And then in his comment, he said, I'm using this to win. Why would I recommend it to an industry <laughs> peer <laughs> or yeah. colleague? He's like, no, I want this for myself. I don't want to share this with other people. So I thought that was a funny way to answer the NPS question. Um, you get that sometimes in, in B2B where it's like, no, I want to compete. I want to win business. And this is helping me do that. And so his, his low NPS score, I think he gave it a zero <laughs> because oh. he's using it to win. Uh, his low NPS score was actually like the most positive feedback that we got out of that project. Come back. Chris, competitive you, edge. Don't always, don't always trust your number scores. Uh, read the yeah. comments, you know. Indeed, indeed Chris, quality. any stories like that from WD at all? Did someone rate a hard drive zero because it gave them so much data access power that they didn't want to give it to anybody else? No, the the one that always sticks with me, it's a, it's a real stupid one because like you, you probably hear it like in everyday conversations. We had a, a tester at the time say something like, this this is so easy to do that my, my grandma could use it. Like it's, it's so easy to do that my parents could do it. Like the, the idea that the person felt like the whatever they had to do set up the product uh, i don't remember exactly what the the task that they were doing or what what product or software they were using but it was really big because at the time we were developing a persona that was actually targeting um older generations so we were we were in the alpha state at that point and the idea is that we're going to graduate to a beta state and then we're going to start bringing in the personas that were a little less tech savvy um, so by that user saying like, it's so easy, my, my grandma keys, we didn't tell that user that we're going to be targeting that segment. Um, but it gave us confidence and we had other data to support like, okay, they do say this is easy. I think we're ready to graduate to our beta tests. And it was just, that's something that always kind of stuck right into just, your hands. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> Not all of them in like that. <laughs> we have plenty of the other side of the stories of this is not, this is not easy. 
please, please fix this. <laughs> um, but that was, that was a positive qualitative story. Yeah. Um, I always like seeing people's faces light up when you tell those stories because it kind of, it gives that human element. I always like talking about the human element. I don't know why. Maybe I'm on the creative side of things. So it kind of affects how I see it. But um, uh, Alex, earlier you were talking about kind of how the beta program within Trimble has been growing. Do you feel like having those stories has maybe helped to connect people to the idea of beta testing here to expand? Not to editorialize your answer too much. No, it it, it can help. Um, I tend to focus on the efficiency we can generate when I'm talking about how to expand our program. Um, the results are good. I always quote raw numbers. I worked with Chris actually a few years ago on how to develop KPIs for my program. Uh, good blog, by the way, you should check out that blog. Well, it actually does pretty well. <laughs> I'll check that out. Um, and I, I put some numbers together that, that seemed to work consistently, no matter what was being tested, no matter what, industry sector we were working in. And so I tend to rely on the KPIs, which is just raw numbers for the most part. I don't have to add a lot of context. I can just say, here's how many bugs we identified. Here's how many features got uh, requested. Um, Here are the number of teams we support. And here's the average feedback per user that gets submitted. Um, So I kind of track those and those are all project agnostic. You can kind of get a good idea of, of the value of the program, regardless of what's being said with that feedback or uh, what product is being tested. Those are all kind of universal values. So I, I take those numbers and I go to new teams and I say like, here's what we're generating in transportation. Um, what would this mean to your business if you got this in you know, our geospatial division or our agriculture division? You know, Trimble does that too. We do, we do tractors and uh, tractor automation. Um, And that story is usually pretty compelling to people. Um, And then the time-saving story. And then the connection, the the other story that that helps with people is just giving them a structured way to do this. Um, There's there's so much, not randomness, but but people just kind of grabbing, grabbing at any way to get connection with their users. Um, and, and most of those people don't have time to really devote to it. Uh, and I offer that I I come in and I offer like, this is our whole gig. This is all we do. We have a structure, we have a program, we have home pages, landing pages, feedback forms. We have structured ways for you to get this feedback and engagement from your users without investing a ton of time. And that usually wins the argument. Like there, there usually is no argument. It's usually like, yes, this makes sense. When um, can we, can we start this six months ago? I've heard multiple people at Trimble say, like, <laughs> I, I, I've been like, okay, here's the project. When do you want to start? And they say, can we start six months ago? <laughs> 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 so everyone wants to start tomorrow. Um, and we're, I'm, 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 trying to get everyone started at the same time, but there's just, there's a tremendous demand just for the, the structure. I think people just, they just crave a way to reliably, repeatably, professionally engage with their users. Um, that isn't like just calling random customers to see what their impression of the product is. Interviews, support surveys, like the, the standard way to, talk to customers yeah and th- those are all important too i don't i try not to diminish what people are doing currently they're doing the best they can um i i like to say like we can we can just offer more we can not we can add on to what you're currently doing to get feedback from your users um so yeah, the, uh, the the thing I, I lead with is usually the efficiency thing. It's just like we can save you time. We can help you capitalize on the time you do have and re- and multiply the returns you get um, by, I, I, I usually say at least a factor of four. <laughs> over, over whatever time you're spending right now, we'll multiply the return on that by at least four. I mean, when you talk about organizational like maturity and you, like you saying, you, you feel like your organization is like a little more mature just by having that centralization and the way that you can speak to this stuff is 
it definitely puts you uh, above. When you think about those teams that were not using you before and you think about where their maturity level was in terms of um, user testing and customer feedback and they're they're using things like, oh, I call somebody, I, I use surveys or you know maybe I email people. We'd say that those things are, are a little bit less maturity. As you grow maturity, you're doing more holistic uh, interactions with your customers at different points in development lifecycle. And you're starting to see how you can apply more data more quickly at certain points based on having a good methodology to use. And so like, I think you talked about it, you, you did your roadshow, right? Like you, you went from, from team to team. Richard talked about it last time on, on our last episode. Uh, Sharon talked about it on the one of the previous one. It's the idea that getting that adoption in your organization is important showing what they can get, proving it, um, handling any objections that you, they may have, that you may have interacting with them about getting the feedback. And it's, it's great. So I, I love hearing about your, your, your roadshow and, and laying the the pitch for, for each of these teams to, to get something more and, and help them. Cause that's what you're there for, right? Yeah. And now, and now I'm starting to get over the hump a little bit where I've, I've done the, the 30 minute demo enough times over the last year to enough teams where now I'm getting people emailing me every week and saying, Hey, I saw this, someone, you know, someone who sits near me showed me what they're working on uh, through the, the, we call it the early engagement portal, um, mm-hmm. which is our center code instance. And it's, I saw, saw the project uh, that my uh, coworker is doing in the early engagement portal looks like it's exactly what I'm looking for, for my product. Uh, how do I get involved? And so now I'm getting word of mouth interest, which is awesome. Uh, I don't have to go to every single person and sell them. Uh, It's selling itself at this point. It's on me to try and keep up on my team and I to keep up. I have have some stories from my my early days at WD, actually with with John Little. You you know John, right, Mm -hmm. Alex? So he's our our VP of of product. But him and I would do those roadshows. So we were doing a combination of alpha testing, beta testing, and also usability testing at the time. And then we had a whole slew of other methods that we're doing. And we had our our, our pitch deck and we'd go talk with the, the UX teams for that division. And at the time we were split into business or, or um, B2B focused things and, and B2C, which is consumer focused. And we'd go do our shopping around, we do our pitches, here's how we can help. And it definitely starts turning into the, oh, I want what that person's doing. And you get the word of mouth. Uh, we even did these things, we, we call them expos. So we would actually bring products to each of these like headquarters. This is when we were all in the office. Uh, we'd bring products and we'd just collect feedback. We we would bring products, let them test it there. We'd be able there to answer questions. And little time after that, I'd get um, event marketing coming to us saying, oh man, we, we want to learn the product. Can you come show us the product so we can get our hands on it and, and use it? I've had worldwide sales reaching out, like the general manager, like, oh, we need to we need to make sure that our, our regional people have access to this information. It's like it just blew up from there. Everyone wanted access to this information beforehand. You don't necessarily want you want information after the fact, after you release, obviously. You need to make sure everything goes well. But having it early is a huge advantage for everybody. <laughs> so you're you're doing you're doing the good work by by uh, getting everyone in your company to adopt, and it seems like it's it's catching fire. So that's good to hear. There's there's something in it for everyone, right? So there's there it started with support, and it started with like we're providing value for support. But now, in a given week, I will be working on projects in meetings with UX, user research, um, uh, product managers, product owners, QA developers, marketing, customer success, all of these different people. And I'm like, I have different things to say to each of them. And they all have different questions that they want to get answered through this process. And they, so it really puts you in the middle of, of things in your organization. And you really quickly get your eyes open to all of the different roles of a company and what they all need. So I think it's helped me really round myself as a professional um, just because you work with so many stakeholders that you eventually start to figure out what makes them tick and what understand and what they need, <laughs> what they need to win in their role. And you try and provide that to them as much as you can. Yeah. 
in my early career too. That's I, cause I started in, in beta, just like you, like my first job was, I was a QA tester and then they also did beta testing. Uh, I'd interact just with the, the testers and then I give information to an engineer who would push it into the company. Um, but as I was doing beta, I got to start talking to all those stakeholders, right? Like I, I got to start talking to product and I'd go network with marketing teams and I'd talk to support and documentation teams and people that built the the actual hardware design and all that. And I, I got to see in a company like what's interesting. I was, you know, 20 something and I, I got to see what everyone did. I got to see what they cared about and they'd show me around and they'd show me what they had access to. I'm like, man, that's 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 what I want to do. So I, I'd find... I, I got really associated with product management. I, I love product management and I saw what they were doing. I'm like, oh, those people are cool. I want to be a product manager. So that's getting the start in beta is like, it's so cool because you are central to so many people because you're connected to two things. You're connected to the product, which is central to all of the organization and the customer. So like those two components together, everyone wants it. Everyone, doesn't matter who you are. Like everybody wants that. Legal is concerned about what the customer is worried about. Right. Like like everybody wants that information. So you're like a you're the hot tamale inside the company. Yeah, it makes it makes retention for my team kind of difficult sometimes because everyone's like <laughs> every every time there's an opening, someone's reaching out to my team members saying, Hey, you should apply, you'd be great for this. And it's like you said <laughs> it doesn't matter what team is is recruiting either. You know, it could be a uh product management, it could be QA, it could be a, support lead or something and it's like hey you could you do a great job you'd be perfect for this it's like well, you'd be perfect for anything yeah and what i really like about testing programs is it just seems to break down the walls like organization wide just get so engrossed in everything and like you guys said it ends up being like an information engine like marketing wants these you know testimonials from customers you know product wants these ideas other teams want these people. It ends up being like this massive like promotion engine almost. Like it's like you can grow yourself and the company just by having a testing program in place, which is always really fascinating to me. Yeah, you you become a, multiplier. a professional de siloer. You your <laughs> your job is to run back and forth between silos and uh, make sure that they're getting disassembled right uh, demolish them. yes exactly <laughs> yeah that's what you do so yeah. we're we're uh we're swinging the wrecking ball <laughs> that's awesome man uh how has center code kind of helped you de-silo in some areas because i know you're kind of getting this virality right you spoke to uh, someone on one team will see it and say oh hey i want that um but other than that you know how has it kind of helped you break down those walls and perform more efficiently as an organ with with the kind of the, the, the customizable permissions that we can set up. Um, we can, we can let people in the organization get involved at whatever level they're comfortable with. If someone is just interested in seeing what the users are submitting and, um, just kind of observing a project, we have observer roles for them. They can get involved and they can just kind of see what's going on. Um, if someone's interested in eventually building up to a place where they feel like they're kind of running their own project or they're running their own community. Um, I've got a, a few people I've been working with recently just because, just because I, my team and I can't personally run every project that we're asked to right now. We have something like 40 projects that are currently active or, or close to active and we have five people, so we can't personally yeah. run them all. So recently I've been trying to identify opportunities where depending on the ask, is this something where I can kind of train up this product manager to manage this, this community, this project on their own. And thankfully I think center code has gotten more approachable in that way over the years. Um, it's, there's still some elements of, of the product that are, difficult enough where I, I need to kind of maintain some involvement in like, Hey, if you need to set up feedback workflows, I don't want to spend time training every product manager, how to do workflows. Um, I reserve my team, you know, reserves the, <laughs> um, administration of the community level because that's on an organization of our complexity that the community onboarding process is complex to say the least and intricate and, 
and I want to preserve that and, and not let things fall apart. I, I call it a house of cards that, that maybe is maybe a, a little bit of a disservice uh, to, to the structure we've put in place, but there's a lot going on at the community level. So we maintain admin at, at the community level, but yeah, this is giving product managers a way to, if they're interested, directly manage their own feedback community for their product. Um, more and more, I have people not looking to do a, a like a four week time based thing, but to give their users a consistent, persistent community where they always have the option of being a version ahead of the commercial release, and they always can provide feedback. And these are often smaller products or or kind of fledgling products that are just kind of getting off the ground. And you've got a small user base that a product manager could potentially support and interact with themselves. Um, and yeah, I, 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 I'm building towards a place where I can pick and choose opportunities to just train up product managers on doing what they need to in center code, um, creating content, um, posing surveys, um, uh, responding to feedback, um, sending out updates and email blasts and stuff like that. I think that most people can figure that out in a short period of time. And so we're really able to expand quickly um, by not insisting on being directly responsible for everything that happens in center code and delegating some of that out responsibly with the roles and permissions that we have set up. So I'm pretty willing to let just about anyone be a project manager if they want to. Um, we use templates to make sure that we're putting best practices in place right at the beginning. Um, that's actually been critical for us. So we developed the template, we determine what goes in it. And when I create a project for a product manager and I get ready to hand it off, it's already got all of our best practices built in. So the feedback is all going to be, you know, we use the same visual theme. The feedback is all named issues, ideas, and praise to start with. If they change it, I ask them why. And if they have a good reason to change it, sometimes they do, not often. So we usually get to stick with issues, ideas, and praise. Um, usually there's a fourth one for discussions. We have survey templates that kind of say, modify this survey and it, you'll be in a good place. Send this out if you have a feature. So send this out if you have a project closure survey, send this out for a software launch survey. So we've built best practices into the template. Um, and I'm getting better about trusting other people, uh, in the tool to run their own projects, um, with our team standing by. And then we get directly involved and we, we kind of heavily run projects for the really higher priority or the larger communities where you have, dozens to hundreds of participants and the stuff that needs more active management. If it's three or five, you know, external developers partnering with a Trimble product manager to work with our APIs or something like that, I, I'll trust that product manager to, to manage that experience. Um, but luckily with center code, I don't have to say no, I can usually say yes to pretty much everyone. Like there's something I can do for you. There's something I can provide. Um, the trouble is is trying not to be seen internally as like a center code gatekeeper and just like this is the person you go to if you want to get access to that software tool. The What I'm trying to get to um, is this is the person or the team that you want to go to if you want to get access to the process, if you want to kind of unlock the potential of this process um, and not just get the software platform. If you, if you want a lesson on how to scale a beta program, you just you just heard – the quick rundown of it, that was ex exactly the things you do to, to scale up. Uh, you, you need those things in place, like those templates. You rely on a central team that has the ability to configure the things you want, gives you access to it, uh, here's what you need to do, and then the rest of it's interacting with customers, um, asking the, the questions that you want. It makes everything look simple. So, thank you. Great, Alex. <laughs> Scale 101 by Alex. <laughs> the, 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 the next part after scaling up and just getting it out there is I think what I need to focus on 
personally is following up with those folks that I've kind of handed the keys over to and making sure that things are going well, that they actually have the time they think they had to devote to this process uh, and that we're, you know, using customers time appropriately and that we're asking good questions and, and keeping up with best practices. Um, I think you, you have, your program has a bit of an internal brand and I'm very aware of our, our program and our brand and our reputation. And when you hand that over to someone, you, you kind of, you trust them with your brand a little bit. And so, uh, one thing that I need to continually remind myself to do is, Hey, check back in with these product managers that are running their own communities, make sure that they are able to keep doing that or see if there's any resources I can free up to help them. We had an interesting comment in our discord recently where um, someone said, nice, everyone nice builds plug. the beta program. Yeah. At, yeah. I got to, got to plug the discord. The yeah. <laughs> yeah. Check it out. Yeah. Metacord.com slash maybe just, um, but yeah, community. <laughs> there we go. Thank you, Chris. If I have you here. Um, but yeah, the comment was everyone builds the beta program at like 30,000 feet, which was interesting. Um, but it sounds like having that structure there, it's just kind of a great way to make sure that the beta testing plane takes off with both wings attached. Yeah. That's just kind of how businesses work, right? Like you have to have the need before you create the solution for it. And so like I could, you could, that that's why this always feels like you're building the plane as you're flying it because you line up tons of opportunities and, and you line up demand and you've got a bunch of people beating down your door and then you figure out how you're going to support them and how you're going to solve that problem for them. But the problem has to exist first. So it's the same thing with like hiring for my team. I, I say yes to opportunities continuously until we're drowning. And then I'm like, okay, we probably need to hire help now. Like we need to expand our head count because <laughs> we can't keep up, which is a much easier case to make than I intend to do more. Uh, you know, I intend Projection. to build the program. So I need the head count to, to get where I want to go. No, it's like, no, we, we have the, the work exists and I'm having to start to say no. Um, or I'm making trade-offs quantity for quality. Um, and it, and I'm having to make those hard decisions. It's much easier than to go to leadership and be like, I, I need to build my team more. I need, I need headcount. I need more resources coming to me. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. you just show up with the massive why and then, and this is the how, this is how we'll do yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. There's the, the maturity. You don't build the scale immediately going into it. You got to get dirty first, run the tests. It's going to hurt. <laughs> um, and, and then you're going to prove the value and it's going to scale. We, t we talked about that idea of um, a little bit about maturity models. That idea of like you set up the scale and the next thing you're looking at, which is the, I, I'd put it in the top end of the, the maturity scale, is the idea of continuous improvement. So the idea that I'm looking and evaluating and improving on these best practices and these templates and I'm tweaking and I'm, I'm looking at these metrics and I'm, I'm, I'm saying, okay, what could we get better? Here's our, our feedback rate. Here's how much we, we actually address or what we, the value that we get from tests. How can I get more? That's the, the top end of the maturity scale. So you're well on your, your way um, with that mindset you already have. So I'd, I'd put you up on that, that scale as well. I'll, I'll, I'll plug the, the program KPIs again, because those are generally, if I see upward trending lines, I know we're building our program, we're delivering more value, we are engaging our users. So again, our, our three KPIs that I track are feedback engagement rate per user. So that is a measurement of for every active user in your project. So everyone who's logged in, how many of them have submitted at least one piece of feedback in the project? Um, whether that's a survey or a bug or a, or a, an issue or an idea or praise. Um, and it, it, you will see that vary based on who you're working with, what you're working on, how, you know, sexy the product is. Um, you know, if it's a black box, that sits under the dashboard of a truck and you get an engagement rate of like 0.2, that's like, great. Awesome. That's amazing. <laughs> something, <laughs> something, um, you know, that it, you know, sometimes you're testing products where if they're working perfectly, the user doesn't notice them. Like the do user doesn't know they're there. And those are really hard to get feedback on. If you're testing a bike with a video screen uh, that you ride uh, for fun, like you'll probably get a ton of feedback. 
Um, so it's, it's different. Um, there are different applications, but it, the metric, you can still track improvement, right? You can still track improvement of, of feedback per user. And that, that number is useful as you iterate through projects. You can look at what your last project generated and I come up with ideas to improve that on your next one, no matter what you're testing. The next one for building a program is we measure number of teams that we're supporting with a project. Um, that doesn't mean that we're actively running the project. That might mean that we're working in an advisory capacity, kind of checking in on them. It might mean that we set up a portal and are providing support for um, you know, if they want to use some more advanced functionality, if they want to set up integrations, if they want, um, you know, help creating content or, or notices or automation, that's still a project we're supporting. That's part of our platform footprint, our program footprint. So we measure that and that's steadily been going up obviously over the last year. Um, and then the last one is community growth just how many users are in your community? Is that number shrinking or growing? Obviously it should continue growing. Responsibly, you should probably have some kind of user purging process as well. If you have users that aren't active or contributing in your program in any way, it's probably responsible to remove those accounts at some point, um, have them sign up again if they really want to be part of it. But in general, your, your, like, your active users should be growing over time. So we measure those three things. Um, I need to, one of the things I need to do now that we're a more horizontal team um, in Trimble's uh, corporate structure is create a dashboard that tracks that in each sector, uh, in each division, um, and and compare and contrast what each division is doing and learn lessons. If, you know, one of the things my leadership is hoping we can do is take things that we're learning from projects in agriculture and apply them to transportation or apply them to civil construction or drawings or uh, some of the 3D modeling applications. Like, Let's try and learn from what these different groups are doing. And I think we're well positioned to help with that. I'll, I'll give you one extra. This is my, my secret sauce for every successful program out there is measuring impact impact is you had you had in their engagement you had in their reach within your company or adoption within your, your your company um you have your your growth within your community which is always good to have not everyone has huge communities not everyone has small communities some people have really big communities but the percentage of feedback that actually has action on it whether or not it's going to support if it's an issue whether or not it's going to your qa team or dev team whether or not it went to the ux team the idea that you're measuring the percentage of things that were either addressed or handed off and something's being done for it is huge. You need to understand that impact so you can – that's the, the, the true testament of all the stuff that we're doing. Here's what it, here's what it resulted what's in. A, what's a quick way that you could set that up? Uh, status. Status is your best friend in the world when it comes to feedback. So every feedback that comes through in a, in a program from a tester – needs to have a, a, you talked about earlier, a workflow. It comes in as new. It gets reviewed. What happens with it? Did we decide not to use it? Did we decide that we are going to use it? Um, will we use it in one way or another? By having those those fields kind of set, you understood action on your feedback. And we have those three KPIs inside Seneca right now, which is um, your uh, Delta score. Which, which tracks things like your uh, or it's your project health, so your, your your Delta Health score, which tells things like how much feedback and how much activities are being completed, which is the input, the data coming in. You have um, the the sentiment range of that feedback, which is the the product success score or Delta Health success score, and then you have your impact, which is the percentage of things that were um, addressed. So those are our, our three. You have other ones that are very program oriented added on to that but those are those are the the bread and butter for and us then you use cross project labels to make sure that that's consistent in every project so right now the those health scores do bubble up to the community okay. level so you can see engagement rates um you can see your your uh, the sentiment across all projects and if you have um 
it organized well enough, you can actually see it by those different divisions and whatnot. And you can see impact on there as well. So what percentage of impact are you having? And it's, it goes above the the hundred percent mark there. Right. <laughs> um, so those, those are my key. You have to have it set up. That's, that's the, the big challenge. And w- when we talked about those KPIs uh, a couple of years ago, about setting those up in a company, it's a roadmap. Uh, just like you don't build scale for immediately, you don't tackle every single um, KPI immediately. There's no way you can handle it. You have to be able to, to grow into those things. So impact is the the upper echelon of of what I'd consider. The, the other side of it is team performance, but that's, that's a, a different thing. But your impact is key. I like what you said about status, Chris. The one thing that I would add to that is also just making sure that every single piece of feedback coming in is assigned to some sort of feature. Because then you can track down exactly like, okay, you know, they had an issue, but specifically with, you know, this element of tracking in the truck, or they had this specific idea that they wanted with uh, with mapping things out, et cetera. And I think that what it allows you to do is you can go in and say, okay, I can see the project level stuff. You know, I can see exactly how well the project's doing and the product's doing. But then I can dive down really deep and get those KPIs for my specific features as well. So you might have one feature that's like amazing, like the screen is absolutely perfect. Um, you know, lots and lots of rays coming in. And then yeah. suddenly you see, oh, well, Wi-Fi is not doing well at all. And it really allows you to kind of focus your intent and say like, hey, let's let's tackle this. And, you know, we can maybe leave this by the wayside and focus our resources. That would be the other element I'd add to status and feature. Really yeah. huge for so the, the product and the, the project that you're running. In the in the program world, he has those those key things. Those that buy in level. Here's what our engagement rates are. We can have that broken down by division. Um, here's the reach we have. So it's X number of teams being supported by Y total teams available. And that that's a sometimes difficult number to come by, but you do your work to go say, okay, here's where I see where I could go, and it's probably changing because you find new things that you didn't know about and um and then things like your impact and how you can support them, which is like your community. So I have this community. I have this kind of result. Um, here's where I'm getting today. Uh, here's the the impact or, or, or results that I that I can influence for you. Uh, that's Absolutely. Another yeah. 101 for from Alex. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's got a we're going to have to just get you listed into a whole bunch of blogs. <laughs> well, <laughs> I think I think we should probably circle back another time and, and, and talk through how I would set that up because that sounds really useful. Um, impact is a new metric that I haven't heard you guys talk about before. So that's, that's one that I, I need to dig into more. Yeah, definitely. Definitely cover that. Yeah. Um, coming up on time here. Um, this was an awesome conversation all around. I think we had so many one-on-ones in here that probably build a whole course out of it. Just this one podcast. Um, but I got a question. It's a two-parter, and I want to pose it to both of you. A, kind of what does the future of user testing look like to you? And B, what are you passionate about in testing? What drives you forward every day to keep doing that? I'll start with Alex. Okay. Uh, the future of user testing to me looks like a – let me let me think for just a second on that um, – The optimist in me sees the future of user testing as something that everyone just does by default. Um, Every company has some kind of program uh, built around user testing, uh, making sure that the products they're building meet user expectations. I see it being a lot more seamless. I see it being less of a handoff experience like okay here's the beta test we can't release until you finish the beta test i see it being much more of a continuum where user testing and i'm building towards this in our program where user testing happens continuously from i have a design i want to get your feedback on this wireframe to i have a prototype i want to get your feedback on this first engineering prototype that we've built to we have our alpha version to we have our beta version to launch and post launch like users and maybe the same users can be engaged throughout that continuum, giving you feedback at every step in that process. So I see it. I I definitely see user testing moving left. If you use the left, right 
uh, convention, yeah. uh, yeah. and and really having a um, an approach to user testing that gets them involved, even in design or pre-design, which is often conflated with UX. But I think I think that feedback can be directed and channeled in the same place that you put your beta feedback, your, your Delta feedback, what have you. Um, and I think being able to con- have a consistent place to measure and track that, um, and the, the changing perceptions and, and giving users a consistent place to go if they want to give feedback on the product that they're interacting with, uh, whether it's in design or beta or, or launch, they know they go to the same place to go and, and provide impressions of that product. Um, so that's where I see it going. Everyone's got a user testing program and everyone's got a, a place for users to engage from idea to execution and all the way through the, the continuum. Um, and then the second part of your question was around what kind of am I passionate about in testing? Um, and I that for me is really user experience and it's it's that it's like day three is is my favorite day of a beta test because you've launched the users have had some time to read your release notes understand your plan and they probably cracked open the product and are using it and they you get those first few pieces of feedback start to come in and you feel the momentum building up and you're like okay we're getting underway the, the you're starting to the work starts to pay off at that point and the way I always feel is like, okay, now the project runs itself. Uh, I don't need to be in the driver's seat. I don't need to, you know, push this so much. The, the, the boulders rolling down the hill and, and that's a really exciting part of the project for me. I really love that moment when you kind of, you've, you've worked so hard to get the project ready to create a great user experience, to minimize your, barriers to entry and, and get as many people as involved as they can be and, and to drive their excitement towards your product. And then when they take that cue and they start running with it and they're giving you the feedback and they're telling you, you know, what they need and what needs to change and what they love and what they hate, that all turns into just pure value that for your organization. So it's just the value stream starts and it just, it feels really good. And that's what I'm passionate about is like getting to that point as quickly as possible and like staying in that mode as long as you can, um, trying to, to harness that energy, whatever it is. It's, it's some mix of like the, the good part of, of human nature. So like there's curiosity and like tapping into people's curiosity, tapping into people's a little bit of altruism where they like just want to help. Um, we hear over and over that like people aren't even that motivated by Amazon gift cards and giveaways and stuff like that. They're just motivated by knowing that their feedback helped and that, that it made an impact. And that's so weird, but I think it's, maybe part of the human psyche that we get to tap into for a few days and maybe if you can hold on to it long enough. Um, so just being able to unlock that is what I'm really passionate about. Excellent. Yeah, great stuff. Um, we just had a recent blog post that was uh, democratizing user testing. So that's where I see really the, a lot of the future of, of this, beta testing, alpha testing, dog fooding, all that stuff. It's the idea that anybody can do it. Because right now we we see a lot of companies that are really small. Like, Alex, you're in a, the upper end right now. You have a, a big B2B company. You've got a whole team. You've got all this. Not everyone has that um, that access to resources. So they're just stuck in the world of, hey, I, I need to do a beta because I'm not confident. I'm not, um, I'm not sure that I'm going to be okay. Maybe we're on a stealth mode startup and we're trying to get some feedback early on with this, you know, real working thing that we have. So the idea that anybody can run a test, whether or not you're in product or support or a UX team or a, a QA engineer, like the idea that everyone can get access to something. And I think that's something that Center Code's really passionate about is, is the ability to get testing into everyone's hand so they can influence their product to ultimately make sure that everyone's experience is better, right? So we want the, the, the idea that we can make technology better by getting feedback from people. Like that's, 
AI is all about that, right? Like you have AI gets smarter with people that use it, right? Products get better with people that use it. Not even just the AI ones. Products get better when people are giving you feedback and and things aren't being developed in like the ultimate silo that you're talking about. Like you break down silos between teams. Like the ultimate silo is building a product in your company without getting uh, people, uh, real customers out in real environments. And over a period of time, like you talked about day three, like the idea that someone's going to use a product for a week or weeks or months or for a year and give feedback on it is so important. It's not 30 minutes in front of a screen saying, I like this, I don't like this. And then you go on your merry way and <laughs> that's that's what it is. Someone's going to change their opinion of using a product after an hour, hours, weeks of using it. And it's going to it's gonna change. Your trucker can get real upset about something that's going on or that company can get real some, upset about something that's uh, of, of cross country travel is important to be able to measure back and forth, right? And then over that, over a period of a month is huge, right? You're going to learn so much more from that. So that that is what I'm excited about is is getting this in front of everybody that can then actually, you know, improve products, make everyone's lives better. Um, and then I, I, I'd say that that's also what I'm passionate about is having a bigger impact on, on, uh, on products. Cause this is, this is how we do it by implementing feedback from people that use it. Well, excellent. Two superb answers there. Lots of lessons learned today. I mean, I'm going to walk away from this thinking about like nine different things. So, um, uh, Alex, thank you so much for joining us. Awesome having you on. We'll have to circle back at some point, round two, someday in the Delta Huddle podcast. Talk about, yeah, but yeah, thank you so much. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to the Delta Huddle podcast by Centercode. If you enjoyed today's podcast, like, follow, and subscribe on Spotify, Apple, and Google Podcasts, Audible, and YouTube. And to learn more about how Centercode is democratizing beta testing for everyone, and to launch your free beta testing program today head to centercode.com. We've got the resources, tools, and help you need to run a successful testing program. We'll see you in the next episode of the Delta Huddle podcast by Centercode. Happy testing.